When you're working with any operating system, be it Linux or Windows or Mac OS, you're going to need to partition out your hard drive to be able to store data. At a most simplistic level, a partition is simply a logical separation of the drive. You've got this single drive, this storage device, and you want to split it up into different areas. And you might put some data in one particular area and a different kind of data in another one. This gives you a way to organize your data on that drive and even divide out your perhaps your system information from your user information. You get to decide exactly how your partitions are designed and exactly what data happens to go where. In fact, that's usually how a lot of administrators will configure their system initially. They'll create multiple partitions. One partition might have just the operating system files, and we generally don't change much associated with that particular partition. We might create a different partition for my user files. And obviously, our user files are going to be written to quite a bit and changed quite a bit during a normal workday. You might also have a separate partition where you put your applications. So as you install programs and you remove programs, that would only affect the partition that happens to have that application detail. You might also think about a different kind of format, maybe basing the partitioning of your system on uptime and availability. You might want to put, for instance, all of your system files in one partition and really separate out just the user files into their own partition. Our users tend to use a lot of disk space, and if they were to fill up every bit of space across the entire drive, there may not be any room for your system to be able to operate. You wouldn't be able to save log files. You wouldn't be able to edit any files on your system. Therefore, a lot of administrators create this own separate partition just for the users and then have the system information in their own area. That way, no matter what your users are going to do, they won't affect the availability or the type of storage you might have available for your system data. If we really want to think about administration or recovery of data, we might want to partition out things separately just in case that individual file system happens to become corrupted. If there was a bad part of a drive and it happened to have in it one particular partition, it may not affect any of the other partitions on your system. So even though one file system got corrupted because of a bad spot on a hard drive, the other partitions would still be able to read and write the data that they needed, and you would at least be able to recover that data a little bit easier. In Linux, there are a lot of options for configuring file systems, designing the partitions that you would like to use. And in a later video in Section 104, we're going to go through a lot of details on exactly the process you would go through to be able to partition your Linux device. A partitioning system that's been around for a very long time is one called MBR, or Master Boot Record Partitioning System. It's been around since the early days of the PC, and you still see it used on a lot of people's systems. The idea is that you might have a single disk, and on that disk, you can have up to four partitions, four primary partitions, or you could have three primary partitions and what we call an extended partition. But you're only limited to four. You can only have four total partitions on that single individual drive. Now, your primary partitions are bootable partitions. It's where your operating system may be stored. It's where you might have a certain type of data set aside. But you also have the option to add on, as I mentioned, an extended partition. And inside of the extended partition, you can create as many logical partitions as you'd like. We created this extended and logical partition piece so that we could get past the limit of those four partitions on a particular system. But as I mentioned earlier, the only way you could boot from a particular partition is if it is a primary partition. If you are creating a lot more partitions and using the extended and logical partitions, you can't boot from any of the partitions that might be in there. This is a good example in this picture of how you might set something like that up. You might have three primary partitions you've created. This is from a Windows device. So it has these E colon, F colon, I colon to designate how you would have these mount points to those particular drives, how you access those drives in the operating system. But you can see an extended partition has been set up. And that extended partition has within it some logical drives. In fact, there's a G drive and an H drive that are logical drives. And there's even free disk space. If I wanted to build out even more logical drives within that, 
I could have many, many more logical drives inside of that extended partition that's been created. Whether you're doing this in Windows or you're doing this in Linux or you're doing this in Mac OS, the idea is exactly the same when you're using the MBR partitioning system. The MBR system was one that really was not designed for the enormous size drives that we have today. Most manufacturers were using a sector size on these drives of 512 bytes, and it really limited the size of the disk to about 2 terabytes. You couldn't go any larger than that. But obviously, the drives that we're using today are much larger than 2 terabytes. We have 3 terabyte, 4 terabyte drives, and of course, we'll probably have larger as time goes on. What drive manufacturers have done in the meantime is they've made the sector size larger on the drive. So they've changed it to 4K sector drives, 4 kilobyte sector drives, which means you could have a total size drive of 16 terabytes when using the MBR partitioning system. Well, that may not be exactly what we want to do. Making the sector size larger certainly has an impact on the amount of data that we might store on that system. So that may not be the partition type that you would want to use for your system. But fortunately, you have some other options available. An alternative to MBR then would be the GPT partitioning system. This stands for the GUID partition table. That GUID is an abbreviation for Globally Unique Identifier. This is a partitioning type that is based on a standard that Intel created called the UEFI standard. There's a new version of the BIOS that is out, and the, the old style BIOS is quickly being replaced by this unified extensible firmware interface. This UEFI standard already has within it the ability to take advantage of these GPT partitions. One of the advantages of this is we can get completely away from those limitations that we saw with MBR. You aren't limited to a certain number of primary partitions and secondary partitions. In fact, it doesn't even use the same type of identification of data on the drive. With MBR, it used something called CHS, which is cylinder head sector. And in that CHS type, we ran into those limitations in size. Well, with GPT, we don't use that type of addressing. So we don't have those limitations. We don't have to worry about what partition might be primary or what partition might be extended. You just now simply have partitions. And you can have up to 128 partitions by default. There's even options within the standard to make more than that, although that would be a pretty unusual configuration to have on your local Linux device. But 128 partitions now gives you a lot of room. And one of the challenges, though, you'll find is that Older operating systems may not recognize this partitioning type. So you can really only use this GPT partition type if the operating system recognizes it, if the BIOS recognizes it. And then you also have to have other utilities that recognize it. If you have recovery tools that you use, the recovery tools need to recognize GPT. If you have bootloaders, the bootloaders need to know where these partitions are. So obviously, they would need to know where the GPT partition happens to be on the drive. But if you keep these things in mind and you're using a modern operating system with all the tools necessary to be able to manage and maintain a GPT partition, you see you've got a lot more advantages than you might have by using the older master boot record partition types. Both the MBR and the GPT partitioning system is a partitioning that's done on the drive itself. It is actually separate from the operating system. You would provide the operating system with a drive that was MBR partitioned or GPT partitioned, and it would know what to do from there. Well, that creates an inherent limitation, especially if you need to take one partition and move it somewhere else, or resize it, or combine it with another partition. And these days, we're doing so much with virtualization that we needed a lot more flexibility in how we manage partitions. If we were able to take that partitioning and really move it into the operating system, into the device driver of the operating system, we would have a lot more flexibility. And what we've created is a new type of partitioning called LVM that stands for logical volume management. This gives the administrator a lot more flexibility when it comes to deciding how you would like your partitions laid out, how you would like to manage them, how you'd like to move them, and create any changes to those. And the way that it works is you would take the drives that you have, and you would create a group, a volume group, that you could then 
allocate out and view differently in the operating system itself. This gives you a lot of flexibility, not only with moving and changing the partitions, but also on how they interact with other partitions. If you'd like to create some striping or combine different partitions together and concatenate them together to make a single set of drives really look like one big storage area, you can do that with LVM. This adds quite a bit of complexity, of course. As you can see just by this picture, there's a lot of moving parts involved. When you have this level of flexibility, there's certainly going to be additional administrative requirements put on top of you, the Linux administrator. So you may be in a case where LVM makes a lot of sense for what you're trying to do in your environment, but you're going to need to read and study up on exactly how you want to lay this out and the commands that you would use to be able to manage that LVM environment. You should also keep in mind as part of the implementation of logical volume management that the different versions of Linux might be doing this in different ways. In fact, some versions of Linux may not understand an LVM partition set of data. Other Linux operating systems may. So you have to be sure that you know what you're going to be able to do with your data and how you'll be able to manage it across all of your systems. Now that we've created these partitions, we have now put data onto these partitions, we need a way to access them from the operating system. If you were using a Windows environment, if you recall the partitions that we were looking at earlier, they had drive letters that allowed the operating system to access the data inside of that system. So in Windows, it's not uncommon to go to the C drive or the D drive or the G drive because that's the way the operating system interacts with the data that's on that storage device. In Linux, we also have these things. They're called mount points. And these mount points are referenced by directories. So in Linux, we might see a slash home directory. That might be a partition that we've set aside for all of our home data. Maybe we have a partition that we've set up just to store logs and other system information. And we might mount that partition under the directory slash var. To be able to see what's been mounted on your Linux device, you can use the command mount. That can also be used to mount other partitions and pull them into your operating system and create a mount point. It's very common to see that done with CD-ROMs or DVDs. Or if you do plug in a separate drive, there might be a separate mount point as you're adding in that additional partition to your system. There's also a table that you can reference when your system starts up for the first time. It references a table in the Etsy directory called FSTAB. That's your file system table that will effectively automatically mount all of those partitions that you need to have when the system begins. And you can also use these mount points to your advantage. If you have a hard drive in a system that you're moving from one computer to the other, or maybe your system has failed, maybe the power supply went out, you could grab that hard drive you can move it to a working Linux system, and you might have had all of your users' data on a partition that you are mounting on your old system in the slash home directory. But you can change your mount point to be whatever you'd like. So when you load it up onto this new computer and you're connecting it perhaps with an external drive controller just so you can get your user's data off of it, maybe you'll mount it differently. Maybe you already have a home directory on that computer. So instead, maybe we'll mount it to home-recover. And that way, we're able to copy and reference those files from the home-recover mount point onto maybe any newer mount point inside of our system called slash home. Very simple to move these around wherever you'd like. You could even do it within the same system. Maybe you'd like to change it from slash home to slash users. You simply change the mount point that's in your Linux system. I have a web server that I use where everything is mounted to the root. I just have one big partition, and everything goes there. This is what this might look like if I use the mount command. You can see that I have a dev xvda1. This is a virtual drive because I'm in a virtual environment when I'm doing this. But I'm taking a mount point just to the root for everything that's there. I have these other system mount points. If you recall our other videos where we had these virtual file systems for slash proc and slash Sys, we can see those virtual file systems right here with the mount command. Of course, I can also see how this is going to start up. If I look at my Etsy FS tab, here is the tab. And you can see exactly the table inside of this that shows, for instance, the drive and the mount point. And that's exactly how it ended up. You can see the dev 
XVDA1 that's listed right there, and it was mounted just to the root of my system. If I had other partitions, I might want to specify those partitions and then use different mount points. I could have a slash home. I could have a slash var. I could have a slash user within this FS tab. And when I started up my Linux device, it would automatically go to that drive and automatically have all of those mount points available when my system started up. In a later video, we're going to step through the detailed process of laying out, managing, creating, and changing partitions on your system. So as we go through that process, keep in mind what we've already learned today about the MBR, the GPT, and the volume management. That way, we can start working with and managing those mount points and be able to use your Linux system in the way that makes sense for your particular machine.